Hello, everybody. This is Gino Johnson, CEO of Champions for Veterans, and I'm so pumped to talk to uh, Frank Bryant, our hero today on our Convos with Heroes podcast. But of course, before I introduce Frank, I want to go ahead and say hey to my dad. Hey, Pops, how you doing? Hey, son, I'm excited, man. We got a great American hero, Frank Bryant here. Can't wait to hear his story. So let's get ready to rock and roll. Man, I'm a motivational speaker, too. This guy got all kind of credentials. Anyway, I'm going to let him tell you that. Oh, so much humility here. I can I can barely stand up to that uh, uh, that notion there. Um, I am a novice, so I, I, I'll let you know that. Though. <laughs> love it, love it. Hey, well, you know what? Let me let me go ahead and tell the people about you, Frank. And man, we we love to kind of get into your story and and hear all about what you got going on here. So, uh, but yeah, everybody, Frank Bryant is a retired Navy chief and the founder of Fucha Future Challenges Coaching. Frank has a passion for helping people and views Fucha Coaching as a business that inspires and motivates you. Mr. Bryant has spent over 25 years working for the Department of Defense in various project management professional, PNP, and leadership roles, which has culminated into his present purpose and passion, that of an experienced leadership coach. Frank is also an independent certified coach, teacher, trainer, and speaker with the John Maxwell team. Mr. Bryant is available for speaking engagements and serves as an independent contractor for private organizations, defense contractors, and the U.S. government. Frank, how you doing, sir? Thank you. I couldn't have uh, agreed to everything you said more if I had written it myself. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. How are you doing, Zeno? Doing great, sir. Doing great, man. I mean, I'm excited to show you a story. Make, so just... Go ahead and let us know. Tell us, tell us who, who Mr. Brian is. Oh, man. So grew up in uh, the outskirts of Charleston, South Carolina. You know how uh, when, when you grow up in these little hick towns, country towns, you never say the name of the town. You say the major city so people can be familiar with it. <laughs> so I'm going to give a shout out to Hollywood, South Carolina. Right? Come on, That's Hollywood, South Carolina. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hollywood without the money. Right. So I grew up there, Hollywood, South Carolina. Um, uh, we grew up initially in a little extended uh, household. Um, you know, my grandma and uh, some uncles, we all lived up in, a, in one big house at one point. Um, and, and it's kind of vague to me, but I remember uh, Christmas and um, and then they all found their homes and uh, me and my dad and our family, we stayed there. I'm the middle of two brothers. There's only three of us. My older brother's two years older, my younger brother, four years younger. Um, and, uh, you know, we grew up in a humble life, uh, humble, uh, meaning uh, financially challenged uh, lifestyle. Um, so uh, that kind of uh, stuck with me. As I grew up, um, I, I was, I guess, the accomplished one in the household. So I ended up uh, going to college, um, <laughs> partied my scholarship out at a four-year academic scholarship. I partied it out, uh, hung with the people that were more like my mindset at the time, which was, uh, you know, women in partying. So that's what I did. Um, I lost my scholarship after, I think, a year and a half and um, went back to school for another semester just to accrue some more uh, student loans because I lost the scholarship. And my son was born and I said, hey, you know, I'm, I don't want any more college loans. I'm not putting forth the effort. This dime's on me, so I'm going to stop this dime. Uh, I dropped out went and chilled with my son in uh, Georgetown, South Carolina at the time for about uh, two years um, around Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And then I kind of said to myself, yeah, this is not the lifestyle I wanna, wanna live here. I got greater expectations. I wanna kind of do some things. So later on in life, um, if my son needs some help, I can give it to him. Um, so I said, huh. Uh, the situation I was in wasn't the best. I was living with his mom and her mom. Um, I always believed in paying my way. So I was always giving money, you know, for gas to get to work because I rode with her aunt. 
um, and money to her mom for living there. Um, and well, you know, I'm broke afterwards and you still got diapers and for mail, all that good stuff. So, and Myrtle Beach was seasonal work. So finally I came to the conclusion, uh, the sacrifice at this point would be to do something with my life, even if I have to leave and do something with my life uh, for the future. And I ended up doing that. I went back to Charleston and I was just walking around uh, in the city and saw a service station or a recruiting station and went in and I had my date set for two weeks later. And the only reason I didn't leave the day uh, afterwards <laughs> was because I was, man, I got to chill with my son for a couple of weeks. I'm about to roll. And he was like, you can leave tomorrow. I'm like, oh, oh, slow down, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I did that for the two weeks and it was the greatest decision that I made uh, uh, in my life. Uh, one of the greatest, of course, I'm married. So uh, we're, we're going to leave that as the, the, the greatest and then the birth of my uh, two kids. Um, so my son is now 27. I got a, uh, an 11 year old daughter in the house, a little bit of a gap, um, but they still communicate. So I'm happy for that. Um, and yeah, right now uh, I, I retired in 2016 after a, a, a wonderful ride um, that was a little tormenting towards the end because in 2015, um, in like a six month span, I lost both of my parents. Yeah. Um, so I, I lost my dad first, I was on my last deployment you know, off of Africa, and then I had to fly back and go to his funeral, and then just out of the blue, my mom took ill, and, you know, I had enough uh, when I got back to go see her for two, three weeks at a time, running back and forth between Norfolk and um, South Carolina, um, and then things just took a turn, and boom, she was gone. Um, so there I was at my retirement ceremony and I didn't have my parents to see me retire. So that, yeah. that was uh, kind of difficult for me. Um, and that was five years ago. That was in 2016, I retired about yeah mm -hmm. five years, almost six years ago. And, um, but now I'm a government contractor uh, doing did project management, program management, because that's the easy thing to transition to. Right, because in the military, we're leaders, right? And we always want to show that in our resumes that we're the greatest leaders ever. And if you do it the right way, and then I was like, man, what else, what else? How do I get a high paying job right away? Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, project manager. And I was like, well, how do I make myself competitive? And then I was like, well, we all do projects in the military. We're in charge of teams that do these projects. Mm -hmm. And so we're project leaders. So you have to um, represent it in your resume through the words and the, um, you know, the, the Smithology of, uh, of using the right words in your resume. Right. And then I said, yeah. I looked it up. I did my research and said, how do I find uh, the right certification. And then I saw the certifications mm -hmm. and it was like, okay, PMP. And I was like, okay, that's what I want. That's one of the top ones. And that's what I want. And uh, that transitioned me well out of the military into the government contracting. So I got a couple of questions for you. And, and I want to make sure I get your Navy rank right. Because and again, like I said, my youngest son's in the Navy, but I know nothing about the Navy rank. Yep. Now, were you a master chief when you retired Navy master chief? I was a chief, E7. E7. Uh, e, yeah, E8 is senior chief, E9 is master chief. Okay, gotcha. Now look, let's talk about let's talk about some of those military stories, man, because I'm laughing with you, not at you, right? Yes. I'm from a little town called Mirror, Texas, population 112. There's 112 <laughs> people in my hometown, but Frank, I didn't grow up in the town. I grew up five miles outside the town on a dirt road. Oh, man. And, uh, okay. and I remember getting running water for the first time and an indoor bath 
Awesome. Uh, I, I didn't think we were poor because my granddaddy was a preacher. So, you know, we, we, we were one of the first families to put an indoor bathroom in our community. And we had a party phone line with three families on one phone line. And the phone, our phone had a ring, you know, ring, ring. And the next family had a ring, ring, ring. And the next family had a ring. And you just kind of pick it up with your ring. People don't know about that. But yeah. talking to you, it sounds like we come from some of the same stuff. Oh, you're hitting home with the, uh, with the bathrooms. Hey, shout out to the, uh, the preachers out there as well. Yes. Look, man, so talk about your military career, man. Talk about some of the mentors, because I can tell by just having a conversation with you. Uh, I mean, you're real sharp. And, you know, I always like to say no one makes it to the mountaintop by themselves, Frank. I mean, all this, quote, self-made garbage. I mean, it really bothers me. Self-made this and self-made that. I don't know any self-made superstars. Somebody helped you along the way. Talk about some of those heroes, brother, that, that kind of guided you and, 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 and gave you some good information and advice. Now, now in my family, um, I have um, an Army personnel, two Army. Uh, my aunt went in the Army for a period. Um, my uncle went in. I had an uncle that went in the Army for a period. And right. then I had two uncles that were in the Marines. Okay. Now, my memory that really influenced me towards the military at first was my two in the Marines because they were the closest to when I was ready to make a decision about my life and, right. so, and, and, and join the military. Um, I remember my uncle, the older uncle in the Marines was, he rode up in like a Corvette one day <laughs> back in those days. You know, and yeah. I was like, oh man, that's fire right there. I was like, okay. Yeah. You know, see if that's what the military does, you know, but, uh, you know, I did the scholarship thing. So I had to do the college and all that, right. but um, it eventually got there. And he's been kind of like my, uh, my uh, mentor, as far as the military, I used to call him and my other uncle, I dropped their names here, Elvis and Joseph, uh, yeah. those two. And they were the ones that I kind of talked to family wise about the military. Uh, and they kind of shared. Uh, whatever experiences I had. Now, in the military, um, my first duty station in Orlando, I was a nuke. Okay. So I'll give it a little twist because I was a dropout nuke. Nukes become CTTs, right? They become signals people when you drop out for being a nuke. There was right. a guy there, Jeremy, I believe, he wasn't my mentor, right? But nuke school was kind of hard, right? So it's supposed to be hard. But I remember that guy, and we were good friends. We want to go out and party, and then when, we, <laughs> then when we flunked out, he was still in the program. But when you flunk out, you go into the holding side of the base, which right. was the party side, right? Because now you're not in the school. You got all this free time. You don't have to study extra. But his attitude his study habits was superior. He knew what he wanted to do. He knew how he was going to do it. And right. although we were good friends, uh, when we went out, he would sparingly, but he would also does, do a study time and everything that he needed to do. So that was the first person that I saw that had great work ethic, right? right? Study ethic. Uh, for the military, and he ended up making it, as far as I know, um, right. and, and, and we kind of protected him. When he hung out with us, we looked out more for him because we knew he was going to make it, and we didn't right. want him to get into trouble. Right. Uh, so, right. and then moving on into Hawaii, in my senior chief, Cerna, uh, we just got the news that he passed. Um, yeah. He stayed in, he was the senior chief in Hawaii when I was doing my sub- uh, runs during those days um, and he was the first person that because I went in the military a little older I did the uh, college time did my son time so I went in at 24 oh yeah definitely old yeah. so yeah. I was mature as a person and could drink right compared to the new kids coming in so when I was there I was an E4 looking to make E5 and he would talk to me as an adult Right. Regardless of my rank, because I was a mature person. Right. So he would instill into me 
when some of the younger guys were acting out or he heard mm-hmm. something inappropriate, he would, hey, right. hey, Frank, hey, talk, talk to you guys. So uh, Senior Chief Cerner, uh, bless him and his family, uh, he was the first person that gave me responsibility of uh, dealing with personnel issues right? without really being the supervisor of the team at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and he taught me how to do it subtly, right? Because um, sometimes you have to befriend a person to mm-hmm. win their trust and loyalty, right? right? right. So when you say certain things to them, they mm-hmm. don't get offended by it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he, and he was also that senior chief where during those days, you could be very vocal, right? Without any backlash. And um, he would be, you could hear him in the office with someone, reaming someone out. You hear all the loud noise. Oh, yeah, yeah, blah, 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 blah. You might hear a couple swearing words too. And it'll go on for about five minutes and it stops. Two or three minutes of silence. And then the person comes out. A couple of minutes later, he comes out. And then he'll go right over to the person and like crack a joke with the person and everyone will be sitting there and he'll walk out and everyone's kind of like, oh, he just laid into him. And then he'll go right over there and crack a joke with him. And then you crack, you know, a joke right mm-hmm. back with him because you understood um, his role. You knew right. he was the supervisor. You knew that you did something wrong. You knew if he laid into you, it was for a reason and you accepted mm-hmm. it. And you mm-hmm. still can talk to him afterwards. You know, it's almost right. like a daddy's son, you know, where the dad lays into the kid and then he goes back right. and hug him. You know, yeah. I love you. You know, yeah, yeah. And, and he was the yeah. first person that kind of showed uh that that discipline, mm-hmm. but at the same time, still give you your respect afterwards and gives you that hug afterwards and say, All right, I still got you. Yeah. You know, it's amazing hearing you tell that story. You know, I always like to say leadership is an art and a science, right? Because that that part of it is the art of, of building relationships and communicating with people. And I can tell, man, you got that. I mean, from just your upbringing to, to people that you dealt with in the Navy. Talk about some of the challenges, man. Even, you know, I, I love talking to vets because like I love to talk to people, you know, having to deal with being away from family, having to deal with performing uh, in tough situations. I always have people laughing. I I did two years in Germany and, you know, I was in Berlin, Germany back in 1982 to 84. Uh, It wasn't no cell phones. You know, you wrote home or what I used to do, Frank, I would make a cassette tape and mail it to my mama and she would do a cassette tape back and I would listen to the cassette tape or I will wait to, you know, Germany was, I think, eight hours ahead of somebody going to say eight hours behind, whatever. It's eight hours different, whatever the time different. Yeah. And I would always call, it would be midnight, and I'll be trying to talk to the family. And and I'll never forget, I'm talking about some of the hardships you went through, uh, Christmas and Thanksgiving were the hardest for me being overseas because they made it, they tried to do, they did the best they could. The meals in the chai hall were always great. They fixed it up for Thanksgiving. They did it for Christmas. But you would always go there and go, dog, I could be at home, man. And and, and I can, I, I was a little depressed, man, being overseas during Thanksgiving and Christmas. What are some of, some of the tough times, brother, I know that you went through and you were able to come through during your military service? Um, Like I said, that first, Number one would be um, uh, losing both of my parents while on duty yeah. because, um, you know, the way we grew up, I wanted to, hey, you know, I made it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they weren't there. So, um, you know, everybody cries doing their little retirement stuff or you cry internally and you try to hold it, whatever the case may be. But. I thought I was good. And then when I looked out there and it was like, this is two empty seats. uh, That's when it kind of hit me. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And uh, so I I discussed that. Um, I don't want to get all misty about that. And the the, the second one was um, 
I had a DUI, right? So I was a, I had just made chief not too long. So um, at that point, you're at, you're in that leadership role. You got guys looking up to you because the chief is like the it thing in the in the navy, right? Yeah. Shout out to the officers, right? But the but the but the chiefs are are, are the it thing. So um, you know, and the fact that we go through a, a specific type of training uh, when we get the uh, the recognition that you you made chief, uh, we go through a, a type of training that everyone knows about. So once you come out of that training and you're wearing your uniform and that hat and um, it's it's special, it's really right. special, right? And for everybody around you, they look at you differently. You know, you could be working with somebody and you were E six, and when you make E seven, you might be that person's chief at at that point. So it's different. Um, yeah. So I was about to transfer to go to Norfolk for my last tour. Um, which ended up being a four-year sea duty. And um, I had some personal things going on. Um, no excuses. I go, I catch a DUI. And at that point, man, I didn't think about uh, my family, my kids or anything initially. What I thought about was like, man, I got to walk in front of my sailors knowing that I had a DUI. And that was just my only thought was like, man, I let everyone down. Like like uh, my sailors, my brothers and sisters in the chief's mess. I was like, I let everybody down. And that was the only thing I could think about. Um, and, and, you know, I did the call. Hey. You know, this is what happened, um, and 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 I had to walk in front of um, my brothers and sisters in a forum because that's what we do. You know, we are accountable. So I had to walk in front of them in a forum. <sighs> Everyone's like, "What happened?" And I couldn't. I didn't want to say anything because it sounds like an excuse. So it was more of man. You know, I, I messed this up. I have this up. Um, and, and after going through that little process, it was just walking back on that base and feeling like, I don't care who it was. Like I left, let everybody down on this whole base. And Fort Meade's a huge base. And I just felt like I let everyone down. And, and it was, um, it was challenging when you look a man in the face or a sailor or someone above you or someone that you're equal, your brothers and sisters, and say, man, I'm sorry, I let you down. I let you down. And you, you have to be humble. It yeah. was a, a very humbling experience um, mm -hmm. uh, that I had to go through. My last experience was um, riding subs. Uh, that was my first sea duty. Uh, Bubblehead, they call us riding subs. It's a different lifestyle. You're out there for, you know, 45, 60, 90 days. You're cut off from the world. Um, the connection with the world was you got a strip of paper. And I can't remember how many words it was. It might have been like 60 words or less, like every Sunday. And you look forward to Sunday, whatever Sunday was, because you really don't have an idea. You know, you just see right. things and know that, okay, Tuesday is laundry day. So I know that's Tuesday. Sunday, we get lobster, uh, lob surf and turf. So I know that's Sunday. Um, so, you know, Sundays you get your little strip of paper. Right. So you get, and that's what you get from your family. You know, that's the conversation. Um, because you get that little strip of paper and you read it and it's real quick because it's a strip of paper. And it's, it's like, hey, how you doing? Uh, uh, me and uh, the kids doing great. Um, Kobe and the Lakers won the championship. And <laughs> right, I'm doing fine out there. Goodbye. And wow. that's pretty much what you get. So that time frame out there, you're like isolated from 
the world. And you don't understand until when you get off that thing and see real daylight um, and, and you come back home, you're kind of trying to get caught up to the world again. Yeah, um, yeah. And it was difficult uh, for me uh, uh, during that mm -hmm. time with uh, uh, the wife, not my wife now, but because she would talk to me as if I was there all that time, you know, I did, hey, all right, so we need to do this and blah, blah, this and that. And I'd be there like, okay, this is just too much. Just let me chill for a day or two here. Let me kind of, you know, get my senses and everything. And um, so, so, so that was pretty difficult. Uh, yeah. Those three yeah. instances off the top of my head. Yeah. And the great thing though, brother, you know, I, I love listening to you talk about that because if you haven't, had to, we call them in the army take a car a carpet trip, you know. You gotta stand on that carpet, man. And and I don't know anybody, including myself, that did 20 years in, they got out scot free and and in clean white as a dove and no stains, right? Yes. Because you're a human being, you know, you say something, you do something, you know, you 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 gotta you gotta, like you said, humble yourself and regroup. And 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 we've all had to do that. And the great thing you made it through. So let's take it. Let's fast forward a little bit. So you do 20. Now, now I know you said 20, 25 total in the Navy or Navy and civil Navy. service. 20 in the Navy, uh, <laughs> now five in, in government contracting. Okay, government contracting. So talk talk about when you got out, man. I want to kind of bridge the gap here and you doing 20 and getting out. Because I did 20. Yeah, I went in when I was 17 retired when I was 37 and the crazy thing Frank this year uh come June I've been retired 22 years uh, crazy crazy anyway thing. yeah 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 it's, it's a good thing gotta keep the heart beat keep them checks coming anyway yeah. but 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 the crazy thing with me man is I never really I don't think I've ever made it to civilian life right because what I learned was yeah I was in the army 20 years, but the army got in me. And trying to na navigate civilian and military life uh, was very difficult for me. An example would be, I'm just being honest. Uh, I had one, I only worked for a civilian company for two years since I've been retired. I took a management position at a major company. And my wife had told me, said, baby, this is not like the army. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna be fine. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. So I, I go there, you know, and 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 I remember one day being on the job, Frank, and this young lady starts giving me the mouth, and I was being nice. At least I thought I was. And I was like, can you do this? Can you do that? And she started mouthing off. I mean, like all, getting in my face just about. And I got, I'm a retired EA, first off. Yeah. Ain't nobody ever got in my face. I can't remember last time anybody got in my face. Yeah. And she comes up and she gets in my face. And I'm on the job. I'm saying, could you go do that? And then all of a sudden, I turn to the werewolf. Uh oh, we're about to write you up real quick. I came out. Yeah. And I went and went fit for this environment. Oh, the werewolf came out. The werewolf came out. <laughs> And everybody's like, oh my God, oh my God, Ranger Johnson. So the next thing, no, Frank, I get into work the next day. I got to go see the store manager because I'm up for an equal opportunity complaint. Yes. I'm, up, I'm on the carpet, Ranger. Ranger, you got to apologize in front of the managers and the young lady, female manager, male manager. So I go in the room to keep my job. I had to apologize. And she says, yes, because I was afraid of you. And I had to eat crow. And I thought, I'm doing my job. I was being nice. I wasn't doing nothing to you. I was being super nice. And you kept getting in my face. And now all of a sudden, that, that switch popped on. And when it popped on, it came full. I went from zero to 100. So talk about <laughs> you know, changing from because your life were brother and life was a different. Talk about being a life for the Navy until the civilian. Just give me some some about that adjustment something right. you had to make. I remember my, my first contracting job. Um, like you said, what when, when you do 
this much time and, and, and that much time in your case, it's, it's, it's become a part of you, right? And, and the great thing that I loved about the military was the camaraderie. You right. know, everybody working together on a team for one common goal, right? And we can fuss with each other, right? But we're going to turn around and we know that, hey, we're going to work together and we're going to get this right, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and, and that was the thing with me was the camaraderie. Um, I, my first gig, I was, uh, and the other thing as I get into this was, the activity you're okay. kind of used to, especially me coming off sea duty of the long days, not used to the long days, but just the activity, having it right. you know, right. full, full of events and you know, you're going and churning and you know, all that stuff. It kind of, you know, people say I'm tired, but it still drove you because yeah. it can't be going um, right. at fast pace. And when I got to the job, I'm sitting there like, the work I was doing, I could do in like three hours, right? I'm getting paid nice, but I could do the job in about three hours. So I'm like, what do I do the rest of his day? You know, and, and, and we had a TV. I was in a private little room, you know, I was in a cleared sector. So, and we had our own TV up in there. It was only like four or five of us. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it was working for the army and I had two army officers in right. there uh, that were our lead. And I'd be up in there like, okay, I, I'm not used to watching TV, you know, all the, be it, you know, the, the, the news networks um, while I'm working. So I'm trying not to watch TV because my desk is facing away from it and the other desks were kind of facing it. So I'm, I'm trying not to watch because I don't think that this is right. You know, so I had to get kind of adjusted to that. And then doing work, it wasn't busy enough. So I'm asking other people in the office, hey, what do you do? What do you do? Um, you know, I'm in a PMO. So there's other project managers in there, uh, mm -hmm. three other, and then we gained a fourth. And I'm asking them what they do, what they do. Um, because, you know, I'm like, okay, I can cross, Trying, cross work. Right. Yeah, you know, find right. out some stuff. And, you know, if you're not here, I do this and do that. And, well, it's not like that, right? right. Because people want a sense of job security, right? We all doing this and we divvy this up. You do your thing, I do my thing, he does, and that's all job security. Now, if you come over here and start doing my stuff, eh, you know, it, it, it kind of uh, uh, lessens my impact. Yes, right? yes. So oh, I had to kind of deal with that a little bit. So j just um, less work. Um, not as being being not as busy and um, just the camaraderie because because it wasn't a whole lot of talking because as a contractor mm -hmm. look if you're talking you're not working you know yeah. we, you would be busy all the time uh, yeah. job security once again um, wow. so, so so that's I had to get used to that when I um when I came out um, you know I I laugh because I'm I'm laughing with you not at you I said during this time period it seems to me people out here go to work not to work go to work not to work yes it's, and, it's a good art yeah and, and just like you you know my mindset was you know you hit you hit you know the units i was in it's boom 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 let's go get it mm -hmm. yeah everybody trying to trying to be as best they can as hardcore as they can we we gonna go do it man and then all of a sudden you come in civilian uh, leadership they call it management. I still call it leadership. I'm a hundred miles an hour, and they don't want that action. Oh, Nelly, whoa, Nelly, look, 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 calm down, calm down. We all gonna get paid, okay? We all yeah. gonna get paid. We do it just casually, okay? Right, right, right. Calm down, yeah. So it was always like, so I was like you, uh, but what I would do, Frank, I would literally, when I was a manager, this is a major store, I would go do my job. Like you said, I could do my job in two or three hours. Then I would go and help another leader out, a manager out. Because mm -hmm. I'm like, man, I, you know, I can't sit over here all day. My, I've done this, and I've, as a leader, I would have people designated and trained and teach them. You know, I'm off to help somebody else. Yeah. That's how I kept going. 
So I would learn how to drive the forklift. I learned how to do this, do that. And I could do so many di different things in the store. You know, I was a major retail company I was with that, that it kept me engaged yes. because I literally could not have stood, stood it to be in one spot for 12 hours. Yes. That's what a management shift was, 12 hours, right? Yeah, it would have drove me crazy sitting there for 12 hours in one spot. Like, you really, man? All right, let me help you. Go over here and go over do that. So talk about, man, what's what's going on in the future with you? What do you see yourself like right now? I know you got you, you get into speaking. Uh, talk about some of the things that you do on that level. What groups are you speaking to? Uh, what subjects are you doing when you're speaking? Give, give us some of that, Frank. Well, um, I've always wanted to do something that's helping other people. Mm -hmm. um, it's crazy. I'm the kind of person that kind of worries about my legacy, right? When you think legacy, you got to think about actors and people that are visible, you know, to everyone. Um, I just, I don't know. I, I feel that I, I want to leave something behind. Um, and I've tried other things before and, um, the, the leadership, I was like, Hey, you know, military people, we all, we all leaders anyway. Um, so I, I ran upon the leadership thing because it kind of resonated with me. Right. Um, I've been in certain positions like yourself, where you might see that, man, Things are kind of jacked up in this organization, right? Or um, certain people are in, in, you know, leadership positions, you're like, man, eh. you know, and um, I, I was in a couple of those instances and um, I was like, man, leadership, I, you know, and you look at this world politically um, in the communities um in the churches anywhere there's a lack of leadership right so, and, and, and um you see things that used to be wrong just seems like all of a sudden now it's right um so i would like to impact the change <laughs> and bring fundamental leadership back um, um uh that's what i believe there's a a, a case of the fundamental that's being uh, misplaced mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. and and everyone search for mm -hmm. their own personal gains yeah yeah no it's fascinating because you know uh, I've been involved in that that world for over 20 years now when I retired I actually got started doing uh, uh, volunteering talking to kids in schools 1998 when I was still in mm -hmm. and and just talking to kids in school volunteering and didn't know it would lead to over 20 years as a motivational speaker and trainer. And talking to, I tell you about, talk to everybody from eight to 80, you know, high schools, colleges, things of that nature. But that passion and drive that you have, brother, I, I can tell you right now, it's gonna do, do well out here in the civilian world because with that drive and passion, you, you said something about legacy and that's something my son and I always talk about, you know, we believe that what, what we're doing here is, is legacy, you know, legacy, being able to, to, to leave something for families to help other people and change their lives. And it's nothing like having a guy like you come on the podcast who's a true American hero and done that and want to do more. So I'm going to throw it to my son right now. I know he's got a question for you. Yeah. Man, Frank, I appreciate what you're doing. And it's really awesome. I know uh, earlier you shared about mentors. And, you know, I think I was actually just uh, listening to, to a course. And it was talking about being in the middle, right? Kind of being, a, having mentors, but also, you know, in order for you to grow as a leader, uh, having mentees. So, so can you tell us about uh, some situations where you've had to, to mentor some other folks? I know you actually mentioned one example of, of kind of being that peer-to-peer uh, leader in a way, but can you give us just any other examples of how you've been able to mentor and lead other folks to success? Well, uh, as a chief, that's that's how one of our major goals, right, in the military. Uh, you have your team, you have your sailors, um, your your 
kind of like the father figure, you know, when they got issues, you're talking to them, you're mentoring them as far as career um, uh, enhancements as well. Um, as they make rank, um, we go through leadership training. Sometimes you are actually teaching the class yourself um, and you're giving OJT. The OJT is on the job training, right? Uh, a lot of times um, uh, these kids kind of come there and, you know, they're, they're still kind of growing um, and, and you give them that hug, right, from, from day one. And as long as they're there and when they go to another duty station, that's what they're doing also. Um, uh, the, the chief or whoever their mentor there is doing that as well. Um, in the community, <clears throat> I'm involved with like the, the education committee uh, for mm -hmm. my city, um, where we kind of give out scholarships and stuff like that to the schools and grants, et cetera, to help out with their activities uh, mm -hmm. of that type. Um, and I've been involved with um, like the Capital Youth Program, um, which is a DC program, DC, Delaware, I think, and also Baltimore program. Um, I'm not still involved, but a few years back, I was involved where you mentored kids at, at mm -hmm. risk kids. Mm -hmm. um, and I did that for a couple of years before we moved <clears throat> where you actually go there on a Saturday, a couple of days during the week, visit with them, mm -hmm. talk with them. And it's like a, um, a military site for them. They come out of their schools, they go there, they're there to finish up uh, um, high school. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that was pretty good for me. So I, I tried to hit all facets of it. And then of course, you know, our greatest mentees are our kids. Um, so um, I've fought my son wholeheartedly in, in that great battle. And um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that, uh, you know, the, the fight was worth it. It's, and, and we're at a, at a space where, you know, we, we conversate now and he's doing some of the things that we discussed previously and all of that. And um, uh, yeah, those are some of the uh, uh, mentee experiences culminating with probably the, your greatest one, your kids. Wow, that's awesome. That's huge. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I can only, I, I can definitely see that. I can see how you've kind of transitioned and grown and continue to lead people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think leadership is just, you know, just looking at your resume and the things you're doing. I mean, leadership is is a big defining factor in that area. What would you, what would you say is uh, just, you have like a leadership, I guess, I don't know, nugget of information or what is, what is something that you, you feel like is just really important when it comes to leadership or the most important part of just being a leader? Uh, communication. Yeah. I would say um, even more so during this time, right? Um, if you look at all these articles, um, business, personal as far as workers, where everyone with this COVID situation over the past two years, um, can you imagine it's been two years? <laughs> two years. So with all that going on, uh, the leaders of this world are dealing with uh, teams, they're dealing with employees uh, that are remote, mm -hmm. right? So this is a turning point because I don't know if the remote work will go back on site or mm -hmm. all of them will. So the arsenal, the, the piece you need to have in that arsenal is communication more than ever right now um, because you need to make them feel like they're involved with right. the company um, even though everyone's remote. So you have to get them together. You have to host meetings. You have to do your quarterlies or monthlies. Um, send out newsletters, if that's the case, if that's your way of communication. Um, and the communication has to start from the top and work its way down to the bottom, right? Mm. Um, I, I firmly feel that if you are a leader and you have your mission, your vision, mm. right? I just, just get crazy, right? The janitor walker working in your building to know what the mission and vision is of the company, mm. right? Yep. So meaning that 
hey, that last employee that got hired, the most junior person uh, as far as tenure, should know what the mission and vision is. And, and, and with that, you have to set the example at the top, get it to your, 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 your right, uh, right. peers at the top, get it to the middle managers, down to the lower managers and to the personnel um, where everyone's on the same page. So yeah, communication no, no. Uh, is paramount uh, for success, mm-hmm. not just in business, but as we know, in our mm-hmm. own personal lives, uh, in the home mm-hmm. and the way leaders are in the community. You know, politicians, et cetera, lawyers, they all have to communicate because they mm-hmm. they need to make you feel like they have heard your voice. Mm-hmm. Um, so communicate Man. hands down. Mm, that's valuable, brother. I want to just throw this in there. As you were talking about top down, everyone needs to know what's going on. I had a flashback when I was in the military. In the Army, I can remember going through different briefings and you're getting ready to go on a mission and the commander would come down and the commander, uh, most of the time, they're not going to ask the sergeant or the leader. So so what? tell me the mission, where are you guys going? They go to the lowest ranking person, the E1 in the room. Joe and Smoke. They, Joe Smoke. Joe Smoke sitting back in the back in the corner. The commander's up front. We got the leadership team sitting up front and they briefed about the mission sudden out of nowhere. The commander points to the back and get the lowest ranking private to come up to the front and say, go ahead and explain the mission from start to bottom. And of course, if you haven't told everybody to make sure you back brief everybody, leadership sitting there tight because they're going, oh my God, oh my God, you know, but that's the test. Does the lowest ranking person in your organization know what the mission is and what you're supposed to accomplish? Because mm-hmm. leadership, if you've done your job right, it's going to be a yes. If not, you're going to get embarrassed in front of the commander. <laughs> Correct. Yep. And if you're that person and, and, and if, if this is the last team, you're all the way down the chain and you're the last supervisor or manager of a team, guess what? You're holding your own meeting. All right. So what is the mission? <laughs> what is the vision? And you make sure everyone knows because you're right. like, okay, I don't want my guy to get pulled out of there and look a certain kind of way. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's almost like how you had the uh, the uniform inspections. Yeah. You got the uniform inspections, and your guy come up there looking all trashy, and you're like, you had him off at the at, at the entry. You're like, look, hey, what's going on there? Look, you're not coming up in here looking like you're not going to embarrass us, right? And you right. just send him on his way. I, I'll talk to you later, right? Right. Hey. Yeah. You have to make sure. And then, um, yeah, when that low person is on track, the organization is on track. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Good deal. Good deal. I've heard that before. I've heard people talk about that, uh, you know, you know, of course, the janitor, whoever's lowest in an organization, make sure they know the vision and mission of the company. But I didn't realize that that's how it is in the military, just that whole pulling in the lowest ranking person. So I can definitely see that. It's funny to see them from a, a civilian perspective and in business, kind of hearing that coaching, but also in the military, like that is what you do or else it's a problem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and you're talking about, you know, uh, and, and I know the Navy didn't do this. You, you, you remind me of a funny story, Frank. You know, we had a guy that we know was never squared away and we had a big inspection coming up, say Monday, you know, Monday the uniform inspector. I'll have him on duty uh, Sunday night. Yes. So he got 24 hours hey. off. Yeah, yeah. I I, I, I I, guarantee you, he is not going to be in front of the commander Monday morning at 0900 hours, okay? Because yep. he's going to be on duty Sunday night, and boom, and he's going to be off, and we don't have to worry about him. And my leaders is above me going to say, is so-and-so, so-and-so? No, sir, he's <laughs> off today. He had duty last night. <laughs> well, they're gonna be like, <laughs> they're gonna be like, great job, Sergeant Johnson. Great job. <laughs> now I know Navy didn't do that. I know the Navy didn't do that kind of oh, stuff. Oh, oh, we did it. <laughs> oh, we did it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, you never put your laundry in the streets. Right. <laughs> That's right. The, the only, the only one the commander's gonna see are the the squared away, spit and polish. You, you know, uniforms, immaculate people. Cause I'm telling you, I, you're not, you're not gonna, 
gonna railroad me with a bad uniform on a major inspection. Yeah, not gonna happen. And if you try, we still have to deal with it, right? We, yeah. I'm gonna have a talk with you, buddy. You, you try to yeah. pull this stuff? <laughs> okay. We gotta have a conversation there, buddy. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I need uniform yes, inspection for the next three days here at a certain yes. time. Because we need yeah. to make sure you know how to get your stuff squared away. Oh, absolutely. No doubt about it, man. Yeah. Funny. Good time. Good, sir. Yeah. So, uh, man, I mean, it's, that's, that is so funny. I mean, it's cool hearing that insider <laughs> information from the service and it's, it's really awesome stuff. Thank y'all for sharing that. But, you know, Frank, before we, before we shut it down and close it out, you know, I know, I know you're doing some really awesome leadership coaching, executive coaching. Can you, can you tell us about just, uh, you know, what you're doing there and where people can find you if they're really interested in using your coaching services? Yeah. Um, and, and uh, I'll send you the link. I'm pretty sure you'll put it uh, down below your uh, podcast here. So like I said, um, a leadership kind of became, uh, well, it sought me out. Um, uh, and I saw it as a way of reaching people and uh, just trying to make uh, the fundamental difference um, in the leadership realm. So I saw uh, John Maxwell um, and, and John Maxwell um, when I listened to him speak and some of the things that he was saying, it uh, really impacted me because the, it, that the values that he has were similar to the ones that I had. Um, and also, we know when you're getting into the speaking realm, coaching realm, uh, as a new person, uh, you need to find some traction mm -hmm. um, and a niche as well. And um, I'm, John Maxwell is my traction. You know, so I, I use his methodology um, starting out here, uh, you know, like the 15 Invaluable Laws of Growth or uh, Leadership Gold, uh, some of his books uh, that are great. And, and, and that's what I teach from now. And then I'll expand into writing my own uh, coursework um, as, as I gain more traction. Uh, so that's the goal. Um, and John Maxwell, uh, I have a website. I'll, I'll put it out there for you um, so you can um, put it down in the, in the link column. Um, and, and that's where I'm at right now. Um, I'm, I'm a novice. I'm still starting out. Um, but I'm excited. Um, I believe, like everything else, uh, dedication and, um, and consistency mm -hmm. uh, will get you where you need to go. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been marketing, putting out great quotes, leadership quotes, uh, putting out my own leadership thoughts. Um, and the YouTube channel is a culmination of that as well, because it's, it's um, my way of talking to people um, in, in this same type style, conversation style, where I talk to leaders in the community and that, and that own businesses, et cetera. Um, just to ask them some of the questions about leadership. You know, what are your challenges? Um, uh, what advice would you give? Um, and I cater my questions to each person that I'm talking to. Um, so so uh, the answers are unique to the individual's experience. And that's on YouTube, it's future. Um, like uh, Gino said, future stands for future challenges, capital F U, capital C H A, um, the leadership corner on YouTube. Come on, come on, come on, Frank Bryant. That's good stuff, baby. Love it, love it. I love it. Yep, yep. Those uh yep, those links and everything will be in the show notes. So we'll be sure to add those to the show notes so people can go in and, and click those links and uh and get to know you a little bit more, Frank. Awesome stuff, man. Well, thank you so much for sharing all this, man. It's been a really a pleasure to hear your story and and just, you know, I really see see how much of a leader you are. I know you've already talked a little bit about legacy, but of course, the last question we love to have on this podcast, uh, it, it's in that same vein, and, and you may have already said most of it, but tell us, you know, um, what do you want to be remembered for? What, what, what kind of legacy and impact do you want to leave on this world uh, when you're gone? Um, yeah, foremost is, uh, spirituality one, you know, I've been working on trying to be a better Christian. So, uh, that's what I want to be number one. Uh, you know, he was, he was, a a person that worked at being a better Christian. 
mm-hmm. um, and a believer uh, in, in, in Jesus. Um, yeah. Secondly, um, uh, a good husband. Um, you know, I've had some teaching moments uh, with my kids that may not go the way that I wanted to go. Um, mm-hmm. But just, to, just just letting them know that, hey, you know, everything was with intention and, and, and with a good deed involved where I'm a, you know, good husband, good, good parent. Um, and lastly, uh, the legacy piece is I, I just always felt that if my funeral is tomorrow and my family, immediate family, and, you know, uh, uh, close to immediate family are the only ones at the funeral, then I didn't do a good enough job of influencing Mm -hmm. other people and reaching out to other people's lives. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what I want. I want to, I want to influence others. Um, And I just want people to remember myself as someone that influenced others uh, by my presence, by my uh, conversation, or when needed, uh, by my advice. Wow. Amen, Frank, man. Thank you for sharing that. I'm with you. I'm with you, sir. You know, that's life-changing and, and world-changing type of stuff, making yeah. a big impact in so many amazing ways. So thank you for sharing that, Frank. And uh, we'll leave it at that. I'll pass over to my dad to uh, close us out. All right, everybody. We just had a great convo with Heroes Visit with Frank Bryant. You're talking about a Navy lifer, man. Look, when you're talking about a retired Navy chief, I mean, as he said, those guys in the Navy walk on water and people look at them like that. So I'm so honored, but you know how I got to finish this video. I'm telling you to stay in the fight!